Well, hello, everybody. My name is Roger Green. I'm the director of the Academy Sacred Geometry. And I also have some other activities under the, uh, uh, under the banner of Breakthrough Technologies, uh, the Therify device, and I also run the Academy Healing Nutrition here in New York. And Michael Rice and I go way back, uh, over 20 years. Um, we sponsored quite a few bioarchitect conferences around the world. So the bioarchitect conferences was about integrating sacred geometry and eco design. And Michael was uh, one of the pioneers of this work around the world. And I've had the privilege to sponsor Michael on several occasions to the conferences as well as events here in New York and various other places around the world. Uh, so it's um, a real privilege for me to have Michael Rice. Um, Michael, can you hear us there in Austria? So Michael's located in Austria now. Yeah. Absolutely, I hear you loud and clear. And hello to everybody listening live and on the recordings. Hi. So Mike, it's probably appropriate to just start with a little bit of your background and then folks, we're gonna go into this amazing presentation that uh, Michael has put together. But Mike, uh, just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved with, you know, and what brought you to, you know, the whole theme of, you know, sacred geometry and the nature of beauty and all of, the, all of these things. Well, you said we met, we met 20 years ago, of course, that means we were only teenagers, correct? Yeah, just over. Seven years old, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah you, were the, you were the big brother, you know? Um, but yes, uh, by way of simple and focused background, I've been an architect for 35 years, and in that time have dived in fully and explored to the best of my ability what it is to build sacred space. And... I did so quite successfully, at least in my mind, for, for, for this time, and resulting in the construction of many, many buildings around the world. And then I was very, very lucky in the last couple of years uh, to meet somebody who, uh, is, who together we have formed a whole new uh, design initiative. And uh, she and I have spent countless hours and days exploring the the nature of design the nature of what is holistic design what is most specifically the power and the potential of beauty uh, as a force of change as a force of design as a force of nature and what is our role as conscious creative beings in the in the understanding, the appreciation, and the creation of beauty, not just in our lives, but in our spaces, in the hearts and minds of each other, and in our ability to connect at all levels of reality. So uh, by asking questions, we have done two things simultaneously. We have given ourselves the gift of relaxing any presuppositions, any assumptions, any belief systems that would have been acquired and solidified over the years and in that same relaxed flow opened up to some spark of connectivity with source some some sense of what is true because as so many poets philosophers artists designers have felt and expressed over the years the connection between truth and beauty is intimate the connection between uh, what truly is and how that expresses harmony is, is absolutely the primary focus and point of contact for our understanding. So uh, we reached out, as we always do, Roger, to you, because your capacity and ability to uh, uh, assimilate and formulate and spread new possibilities has always been the backbone of what you did, in my opinion. You delved deep into the, the traditions of the past and grokked them, understood them, took them into you, and then expressed them in a unique way. And you've always supported me and others to do the same. So to yourself and anyone listening, what's, uh, what's been offered here is uh, a sharing and a connectivity 
and a both a playful but playful doesn't mean uh, flat playful and yet deep look at something so fundamental that it is missed by mo most people and that's the thing that is so shocking and so revealing and when I show the presentation there's a few slides that will illustrate this point but something as formative as affecting and as powerful as beauty as a force of conscious creativity is relegated to secondary and tertiary and quadrinary levels of of importance and it is superseded by uh, utility for example and function and even and even science which seeks to understand and explain but very difficult to explain and understand beauty in terms of what the truth is seeking to express through that. So that's a little bit of an overview. We also have a vision that has spoken deeply to us when we met and ever since. And that vision is about the creation of what we are calling temples of life through a beautiful open sourced process and we will be touching that at the end of this presentation as a planted seed of inspiration for anyone listening so that's a, a rough overview and but certainly in terms of sacred geometry which I understand is a title and an anchor for this whole connection sacred geometry for those who are new to this is a an art it's also a science but it's basically a model of understanding the world and the workings of the world through the study and application of patterns and forms, algorithms, symmetries, uh, literally geometries. And so when we observe and see these at different levels of creation, they are like maps of our focus, maps of attention. They are guiding us on the landscape of experience and existence and giving us a sense or a hint of the terrain <clears throat> that we move through when we when we breathe when we physically walk and, and run when we make love when we give birth when we die all of these biological and psychological functions and forms are governed to some extent by uh, the geometry of life and i have utilized those for decades as patterns for the creation of space and i was quite confident and some would call it arrogantly so, somebody would call it innocently so, but I was quite sure that uh, my understanding was, was, was clear and <clears throat> although I wouldn't say complete, sorry, one moment. Mm -hmm. My understanding, I realize in the last couple of years is far from complete. In fact, it could be actually at the point of limiting my ability to express truth and beauty in design. So uh, what was absolutely required and what has been a, a beautiful process has been a, a, a natural slowdown sufficient to take breath. And in that breath to breathe in some pure principle that was knocking on the door of my perception, seeking to be understood and integrated and able to be developed into a capacity to design consciously. So this was never more obvious when I and Zana, my design and life partner, when we came together to form Zenmark Design a year and a half ago. And uh, what's really beautiful, actually, is that uh, our two names articulate the name Zem, Z for Zana and M for Michael. But in Slovakian, uh, her native language, Zem actually means earth. So earth.design just seems such a beautiful place to begin, because for me personally, it required me to get down to earth, to ground myself, to feel the naked feet on the ground and see what's real, what's true, what works and what doesn't. So uh, it was scary and it continues to introduce a few psychological speed bumps as I open myself to what 
what the truth of beauty is and the beautiful truth that it contains in terms of conscious creativity. So that having been said, we have a presentation that we put together. So with your approval, Roger, I will share screen and we will begin that. Yeah, that would be good, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into the presentation. Michael's got this beautiful, comprehensive presentation here. Okay. So I would like you to confirm if you can see that now, Roger, can yeah, you? It came up really nice, Mike. It's full screen. Okay. It's looking good. Wonderful. So we've entitled this uh, Repleted Space and Holistic Design. And what's really interesting is that uh, we, even, we even noticed that, on, Roger, on your description, you refer to it as sacred geometry and eco-design. And then somewhere else it was described as uh, bioarchitecture design. So it's, uh, in a way, it's very funny because uh, we are all seeking to find a way to substantially and coherently uh, describe something that could even be beyond the limits of language. That when we talk about eco design, that may evoke a sense of, uh, you know, low carbon emissions and eco materials and green design protocols and so on. When we talk about bioarchitecture, even though, even though we were very much part, you and I, Roger, of the formulation of it as a understandable design philosophy, it has been uh, hijacked and piggybacked so much since. So um, what I'm conscious of is that if we continue to use these labels uh, collectively without a shared understanding of the underpinning philosophy and the truth behind them, we can easily distract ourselves and others with the, with the meaning behind it. So some people think bioarchitecture is something to do with bio toilets and, 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 and so on. <laughs> and uh, we have bio detergents and, and bio this, that and the other. Yeah. So when we, when we formulated the expression repleted space, um, it was particularly powerful for two reasons. One, because it pointed to something very profound but on another level, uh, it was actually Zana who formulated the word repleted space. And I didn't even know the word. It's, it, for those listening, those native English speakers, repletion and repleted are not commonly used in, the, in everyday parlance. So the best way of knowing it is what it isn't. We're well familiar with the word depleted or depletion which would refer to a limited or um, lessening supply of something vital, depletion of the, of the water supply or so on. But repletion is the very opposite. Repleted space is a, is a space that is full and free and able to uh, express and reflect the consciousness of the inhabitants to the fullest and most beautiful extent possible. So repleted space. Word. You don't off, You don't really see this. No. Uh, no, it's not. You know. So we were. I was fierce impressed. I must say. You know. Where did she get that from? And, uh, she, she couldn't sufficiently tell me where, but it, it downloaded perhaps even from source where all the best things come. And of course, holistic design is not necessarily new. We're well used to the concept of holism. I mean, this is your beginning, Roger, in the Taoist understanding, which is intrinsically holistic design. So the holistic design is linking repleted space as a description of what we do. And of course, contained within that is bioarchitecture. Contained within that is sacred geometry. Contained within that is permaculture and countless other design philosophies, including feng shui, and dowsing, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than fractionating it into a series of separate disciplines that each have to be considered separately, uh, we have pulled it all together into a design action and a design philosophy that at its very core is about beauty. And that's the whole essence of this presentation. And I, uh, we trust and we, we believe that by the end of this presentation, there will be a sense of what it is we're speaking about. Because when we open to what beauty is, if we do our job right and communicate this sufficiently to you, you will be shocked. 
you know, because it's shocking me, it's shocking us in terms of its importance. So having said that, we move ahead to the next slide. So we wish, and I'm sure everyone listening would have a similar version of this for their own life meaning, we wish to be free to create consciously because we fundamentally believe that every human is free and that there are no rules that govern or limit possibility. Of course, there are matrix level rules and there's social agreements and there's collective assumptions, etc. But there are no rules that govern or limit possibility at the level of our fundamental nature. And why we are sharing this today, why we do what we do, is because we seek to design in truth and we wish to create in truth. And for that to be the case in every level of expression in our lives. And we do that by connecting with other people and by sharing what it is we know and what it is we can do. And the thought of all of this is basically offering beauty. Of course, beauty is not ours or anyone's to offer as a thing, but beauty exists independent of us, but it, it is very open to be connected to and with and through us. So that's our mission statement in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So in order to um, be a bridge from what we would have spoken about before, Roger, and what we're opening today and what many of the listeners and viewers will already know, we want to make this bridge of sacred geometry. So this was a lovely image that I found recently. And uh, it's a graphic that indicates the hydrogen electric, electron orbitals as a pattern of probability density, blah, blah, blah. In other words, it's a series of images that are indicating where the geometry of life at the most fundamental level is expressing. So straight away, we can see that there is a beautiful natural obsession with symmetry and pattern and form that can be expressed geometrically, volumetrically, arithmetically, mathematically, etc. So all of these, from the graphic to the mathematical, exist as language which we give meaning to and we develop the language from a simple alphabet to full sentences and ultimately poetry in what we do and what we say and how we create. So atomic symmetries are a fundamental pattern. And of course, um, our colleagues, uh, Roger, and many other people from Dan to Paul and Nassim and all these wonderful uh, thinkers, philosophers, doers and makers, you know, they are all um, understanding this principle that, that life loves pattern and that these patterns we inherently and intrinsically find beautiful. So here we have a collection of images which at one level would be considered cymatic cymatic uh, functions and cymatic expressions are literally patterns of vibration that are displaying themselves as visual forms like mandalas. So here we have a beautiful colorful collection of rows, windows and cathedrals, and geometries, mandalas, patterns and DNA itself. And so there's this beautiful synthesis between vibrational signals giving shape to form and the patterns of artistic expression, not just artificial and man-made, uh, but at the fundamental level of life itself. So what we fundamentally uh, believe is that nature expresses living harmony through form, through self-organizing movement and through change. An original unity consciousness, whatever words or words make sense for you in that meaning, but unity consciousness, source, oneness, breathes the spark of life into all natural creations, which embody this truth and hold the memory of it at every level of expression. So another beautiful word that uh, came into being uh, through uh, our conversations is alivement, which is both a state and an action and a movement to bring life into space. And as we know, nature does that effortlessly. And at some level, most of us have forgotten how to do it effortlessly. 
in part because we have sought to create through modeling, through modeling design philosophies that may not always apply in every situation or may limit the ultimate expression. They are absolutely useful for a mind that is obsessed and has a lust for meaning. And that meaning can be beautiful in its, in its uh, experience and in its expression. But nature effortlessly gives life into space and forms space through life. And we, we love that, we resonate with it, and we're seeking to design and create with this as a basic knowing. So certainly you could go onto Google Images and have a trillion examples of how nature expresses the beauty of form very, very differently, very openly, yet all of them expressing intrinsic truth, the truth of where they are growing, where they are living, where they are expanding, that the form is an integrated, truthful expression contained within and expressing through the environment itself. So, um, we are all well familiar with the double slit exp uh, experiment and the role of the observer. Those of you who are even passingly interested in quantum knowing, even th the two words quantum knowing are a little bit of a um, uh, not an oxymoron, was it? Basically, it's, it's a paradox because you cannot know at the quantum level. So quantum knowing is the biggest con job, you know? But in terms of the, the, the double slit experiment, it's where two streams of electrons were given an op or, or photons of light, but basically particles were beamed through two vertical st um, strips, openings, and they were beamed onto a plate that was able to record the effect. And what was expected and anticipated was two vertical lines indicating where these, the, street, the two streams of the electrons were actually meeting. Uh, but what was observed was an interference pattern, much like this top and bo bottom image, which would indicate that the particles that made their way through these two slits were actually interacting and expressing as two waves, much the same as two stones or two pebbles dropped into a body of water and the interference pattern between the radiating vibrational effects. So that was interesting enough that it, it became known as the particle wave duality and it was difficult to understand and still is of course, but it got a little crazier than that because when single electrons or other particles were sent through one at a time, it was imagined that this would result in a single point of reception or perception on the on the plate at the back. But again, the same wave pattern was observed. That was crazy enough, but it went even further because then depending on who or who was observing in terms of what they were expecting was directly affecting the outcome of the experiment. And then they took it even to a crazier level whereby they changed the possible outcome but the, the actual measured result was uh, based on something that was yet to be decided as a, as a way of observing. In simple terms, consciousness was having a profound effect on the fundamental substrate of reality. For anyone that has done any work on themselves and has dived into their own dream state knows that this is true. So this is, this is 101 basic class kindergarten stuff for anyone listening right now. But I mention it only because of the importance of the observer, which is never really a, a, an observer because we can't uh, observe without taking part. So we are both creators and experiencers. Observer is actually no longer a useful word to use. So one of the things, that when, when we start opening the nature of consciousness, and start seeking to understand it as a conscious creative power and force, uh, especially fueled by beauty and truth, then we rapidly know that without life, there is no consciousness. And without consciousness, there is no life. And one of, one of our um, heroes is uh, Rupert Sheldrake. He's a British biologist who speaks and writes extensively about a new science of life. And he touches and has really given great support to the scientific notion of morphogenetic fields, which would basically be bodies of information and knowing that are shared across life, across time and space, by each level of life, each expression of life, 
which is an inherent memory from the past that's available in the present and may even be uh, creating the future. So he would say that life, anything alive, which is a compound, a compound of different elements coming together naturally, created by, by the universe itself, they're basic, it's, it's filled with the spark of source. It is alive and it, it generates and represents and holds and expresses consciousness. But when we, when we create a mixture, mixture, like a robot or artificial intelligence, or most specifically a physical building, there is no consciousness, in our opinion, in a constructed object. That object can be a computer brain, it can be a building, it can be a city. So we, we are asserting and exploring for ourselves the very real possibility to us, it's a certainty, but we wouldn't wish to assume that on anyone else, that a space is not conscious, but a space can become alive through the interface with consciousness. So fractal consciousness, this is a graphic that is just seeking to understand it as a, 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 a workings of the mind uh, in terms of the ability to fractally embed in the whole. So many of your listeners and viewers, uh, perhaps all of them, will understand the word fractal, which is shape similarity across all the scales, which is the same pattern that's able to embed within that one that's similar but bigger and enable to inform one that's similar but smaller. So this beautiful harmonic fractal cascade of shapes and forms, both physical and energetic, that's the nature of fractality, which is the nature of how energy and information appears to move in life itself, which gives us a map of connectivity and a network of knowing from the subatomic to the macro galactic level and beyond. So that whole spectrum of expression is accessible to us because we are part of that. So the notion of as within, so without, how we see the world, how, what we believe we're seeing, and how we interact is generating our reality, absolutely. So one of the areas of scientific study that has excited us and continues to inform our understanding is that is called neuroaesthetics. It's a relatively new science that's seeking to explore and understand the relationship between perception and physiology and psychology. So it's using brain, the brain, to map and measure the effects of us looking at beauty, whether that beauty be within within natural context, such as a, a forest scene or a set of, or a bunch of flowers or the face of a, a loved one, or if it's looking at something that was created, but created consciously with beauty in mind. So, the 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 results and the testing is shown, and the studies are absolutely giving giving evidence to the effect that beauty is changing our physiology, our neurophysiology, our, our physical uh, movement and body. It's producing serotonin and other neurochemicals in the brain that make us feel good, enhance our comfort, allow us to relax enough to extend our aura, our bioelectric field into the space and make a reflective connection with other people, with life and with the space ourselves. So the science of perception is a beautiful field, which is another pointer. It in itself is only one way of looking at this. And of course, as we know, and as we would feel as this presentation was on, science is a wonderful tool for understanding, but it's only part of the equation of knowing. So we have here an image of a golden sunset and a beautiful picture, of course, by any measure of, of opinion. But somebody has taken a uh, copy and paste and uh, inserted a grid, a golden spiral grid. You can follow it, the red spiral, as it moves towards the center point of focus. So this harmonic grid is showing us that either the photographer was consciously aware of this in terms of, of a mathematical positioning composition, or if it was a natural, intuitive, instinctive snapshot. 
that was then uh, uh, cropped to make this image. The point is, it doesn't matter. Our attention is being invited to follow the path of focus, which in this case is the sun as a primary node of attention. And then as a series of fractal overlays that come back to meet us from the distant sun to the rocks and the, and the water in the foreground. So as an image, whether we're viewing it as a static presentation on a computer screen, or computer screen, there is an interesting uh, mistake yeah. of language. Okay. Or we're actually there in the stream of consciousness that is the place and space uh, that we inhabit in the viewing of this. So here's one more image. It's the famous uh, Venus rising. And again, this uh, image, this painting, can be uh, studied through the eyes and the filter of a harmonic understanding. And we can certainly put a series of lines and form meaning and form a correl correlative um, appreciation of what the artist may have been doing. Of course, we don't know for sure if this was conscious or if it was artistically, sensitively automatic. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. But what these two images are showing us is that we retain an obsessional lust for meaning. We're, we're so starved of harmony in our own creative endeavors that we're seeking to find it in everything from the past. And that's okay because we can learn from the past. We can um, assimilate the knowledge that these ancient and not so ancient artists, designers, creators, um, architects, designers, that they felt and implemented beautifully into their work. And what's important to, oh yeah, the next one's interesting. Before I go to the next slide, I want to say that for hundreds of years, until the beginning of the last century, if you were to ask anybody who had the time to, to consider the question, if you were to ask them, what is the purpose and meaning of, of, of art, of music, of architecture, of any creative expression? The answer would be basically beauty. That beauty was the, the purpose, beauty was the end result, beauty was the vehicle, beauty was the destination, that all of these expressions of harmony and truth and, and the purity of expression, they were, that beauty was the engine and the fuel, the destination and the vehicle. However, as we began to lose our way, now I know when I say that, that I'm probably going to make some reaction when I say it, because on one level of being, we have never lost our way. This is our way. This is our way of becoming. This is our way of, of understanding who we are by forgetting the basics and then relearning them in a new way. So I'm, I'm mentioning only within the context of when we, start, when we started to create ugliness in our art and architecture, when we began to use art and architecture as expressing the shitty environment that we were both creating and experiencing directly, rather than letting art act as an ideal that can bring the reality into a new expression. So, for example, and any of you can do this after this, after this presentation, if you go into Google and you type in into Google Images a single word, beauty. Guess what you get? Here's what you get. Page one. Now, guys, is this what we have become? After thousands of years of the most profound expressions of beauty in our physical environment, in our every level of creativity and creation, and Google with its, its, its AI algorithms and the collective expression of human focus and this is the best we can do on page one when we're opening to beauty. Each one of these images is many steps away from reality. They're photoshopped, they're touched up, and even if they were a true image, there's layers of makeup which is filtrating the true beauty. So this is the perception of beauty that most people inhabit, uh, assume, expect, and, and strive for. And that level of disconnection is expressing in our physical buildings as well, as we will see. 
So I don't want to give you loads of examples of what isn't beautiful because really we wish to inspire and connect you to this original source setting. So beauty to us is sensory evidence of source. Now, again, we have the limits of language. What is source? Is source God? Is it unity consciousness? Is it the infinite? It really doesn't matter. I think everybody listening and reading and watching would get a sense that source is that which is the sparkling um, centering of all life. It is the, the clear purpose through which life expresses. So to, to us and to everybody, if they're really honest with themselves, beauty brings meaning to life. Beauty invites us to see with very clear eyes and with free emotions. And beauty is, can even be considered a weapon against the forces of ugliness. Now, we're not big fans of using language of conflict, but, uh, but a weapon immediately evokes the idea of power. And beauty is powerful. It has the power to change consciousness. It has the power to direct attention and focus into a whole new way of both seeing yourself and your relationship to the world around. But the beautiful thing about beauty is that it does not require explanation. It doesn't require understanding or usefulness. It doesn't require to be useful in the normal limited meaning of the word. And it connects us directly to the mystery of being. So it basically brings us into the presence of the sacred. So the experience of beauty, guys, you know, it calls us to the divine. It's like a, a whisper that is continuously on, in both ears, but penetrating through the vibrations of the heart. It calls us to the divine. It is, in fact, the key to consciousness, both here, here, and in every cell in the body, that is seeking and inviting connection to source. At the human experiential level, beauty brings con consolation in sorrow, and it also gives affirmation in joy. Now, for those of you who can see this, the image on the right, this beautiful lotus flower, this image was sent to us, sent to me, just a few hours ago by a wonderful friend and a client in uh, East Coast Australia, and just north of Brisbane. And... Uh, she and I haven't been in touch for some time, but she sent an email this morning that during her meditation in the house that I designed for her some years ago, she was able from her meditation space to look out at her garden with the lotus flowers. And as she was breathing through her meditation practice, her eyes remained open and focused on this flower. And as the sun rose, the flower opened in in. in symphonic concert with her own process and she felt she said she felt me and heard my voice just tapping on her shoulder so she reached out by email later and sent me this photograph so i had to include it in this so her, na her name is mel thank you mel and uh, just wish to honor you for being tuned in to to this flow and to Give it as a real example that beauty is knocking on all of our collective doors all the time. And it's, it's infusing connectivity in all the networks, old and, and new and future. And it's, it's, it's moving and traveling and whispering through all of that. So beholding beauty, perceiving beauty with the eye of the mind, uh, through this, you'll be able to nourish true virtue and become a friend of God. That's a slightly paraphrased quote from Plato, one of our, one of our heroes. So, you know, Plato had a very, he was an idealist, you know, and he wanted to see the truth and essence behind, uh, behind reality, behind nature. So I love this idea that through consciousness, we're able to nourish true virtue. And virtue is, goes far beyond notions of morality or being good you know it really touches something much deeper than that something fundamentally and intrinsically true and becoming a friend of god i love that one you know <laughs> so whatever that might mean to you so oscar wilde great guy and uh, but he said all art is absolutely useless now at a flat level 
the, this, that statement might cause a reaction. What do you mean it's useless? No, it's very useful. It, it excites you, it inspires you. That's not what he meant. He, what he meant was that uh, beauty and art are so far beyond concepts of utility that their value is not linked to the, the utility of the expression of the art, that the value is in its ability to, to transcend limits of mind and feeling to open up beauty as a force of change so that it's intrinsically useless because utility plays no role, not in the normal meaning of the word. And we have become obsessed with utility. How many people, Roger, and any other designers that you will have advised and, and inspired and connected and supported over the years, how many clients were ever in a position to generate or create or manifest something purely for the sake of beauty? You know, there was always a utilitarian purpose. It could be a beautiful utilitarian purpose, like a, a, new, a new home or a new center or a new space of healing or a new piece of art. But always there was this uh, very limiting but very understandable link between perceptions of value and the value of the investment, both in terms of time, energy, attention, money, and the uh, believed use, usefulness or utility of the final product. So this became ever, ever more pronounced when beauty stopped being the purpose of art and architecture. And we began to become more focused as a people, as a society on functionality, on utility. And of course, when you focus only on utility and not beauty, then we miss the point. That which we create rapidly use, loses utility. But if we create with beauty as a primary force and energy, then it becomes eternally beautiful. Eternally beautiful. So, oops, let me go back one slide there. I got distracted. Okay. Presence with and within the presence of beauty presents repleted space. There's a little bit of a dance with the words there, presence. Because presence means uh, being with something. Presence also means an energy in the room. Presence also means presenting something. In other words, displaying it or expressing it. And of course, present means gift. So of course, this only makes real sense when we dance with English. But we played with it a little bit here. So presence with and within the presence of beauty presents repleted space. And of course, the ultimate repleted space can out of, out of human experience is within the heart. And then we can certainly train our minds to be repleted. And through this lovely synthesis, we can begin to express repleted space in our physical and built environments. So perception and interaction with beauty generates an inner condition which transforms our hearts into fractal attractors. To use Dan's wonderful expression, Dan Winters, our great, great buddy. Which and that once we transform our hearts into fractal attractors, into which the environment is invited in each and every moment. So because of the fractal nature of the harmonics of the heart, we're able to download and integrate and feel the environment. So we welcome it into us and we give it life. We breathe the life into the environment through consciousness. Okay, a little bit of history here, guys. The Roman architect Vitruvius, he wrote a treatise on architecture called De Ar Architectura. And to him, there were three principles of good architecture, which also apply to life. The first one was formatus in Latin. It means durability. So to him, good architecture should stand up robustly and remain in good condition throughout as long, many years as possible. Utilitas, which is utility, it should be useful and function well for the people using it. The first one, of course, we use the Great Pyramid here. Some say it's 4,000 years old, others say it's 35, who knows? But the point is, it's certainly impressive in its durability. Utility, um, we're, we're, we're being a little bit provocative here by showing the Pentagon, but in terms of its ut usefulness and function, both in terms of physicality and energetics, uh, it certainly does the job that it's intended to do in terms of a centering force for a certain level of consciousness. 
And um, venustasis, beautiful word, it means beauty. It should <clears throat> delight people and raise their spirits. So speaking of raising spirits, uh, this is water, not spirit. Oh. Those listening and watching should know that just because I'm Irish doesn't mean I have whiskey right next to me all the time. So, so uh, we are dancing with this next level that there is a fourth principle of good architecture, which we're referring to as saturitas, which is a beautiful word. It means repletion. And we described that before. So to us, a space should reflect the best potential of the occupants in conscious and coherent relationship with the land, with the body, with the space. So repleted space. So beauty. I should say that these two photographs were taken from one of Antonio Gaudi's buildings, his homes in Barcelona. So we made a what was ultimately a pilgrimage to his work uh, earlier this year, which was very, very affecting, very revealing, and in no small way affected our understanding of repeated space and also the power of beauty. So beauty, when incorporated, maintained, and enhanced within a space, encourages full sensory perception and optimizes human focus. And this offers the opportunity to engage more consciously with the environment then the environment can radiate this consciousness and interact with it in a living way. And everyone that goes in here, regardless of their background, their training, their sensibilities, cannot but be moved by that radiance. But it's important to iterate again and again that the building in its basic functionality as an object of creation, of human creation, does not hold the consciousness does not exude a special field of energy. It doesn't heal. Now, this is controversial. I appreciate that and a bit provocative, but it is our belief and our experiential knowing that a building does not heal. However, healing can happen. And uh, we will explain how that works to the best of our ability. This slide doesn't require words. So just as, as beautiful form, I wanted to give uh, the viewers a chance to relax from having to read. Just soak in what's, what's here. It's really uh, very revealing. Okay, this, we love this. So th this is a photograph of a construction about a meter, three or four feet wide in the roof space of one of Gaudi's houses which are like a museum in a way to his work. And what it is, is a network of a web of very thin metal chains that are supported and hanging due to the gravity field of the planet. So what he worked with is that when, uh, they're called catenaries, but basically when a chain or a string or a series of beads on a rope, when they are free to hang, between two points, they would naturally form this beautiful geometry. So what Gaudi did was so cool. He basically took a photograph and reflected it upwards. So basically this geometry informed his structures, his domes, his large vertical spaces. Isn't this absolutely beautiful? So he defined a geometric pattern on a flat plate. He then came up with lengths of string, or, or in this case, very thin chain, uh, the likes of which you would hang around your neck. And with this gossamer web, he uh, chose different lengths and then hung them upside down and then saw how they looked in the reflection of a mirror. And this gave him an understanding of what wishes to be breathed out from the living earth into a physical form. So. The gravity field of the planet is an expression of source. You know, this, this living plane of existence is, is fueled by living gravity. And that is very much an algorithm of source. So source induces in us sparks into our minds, which initiates and guides movement. And that movement helps us to do, to make and create. And then it helps us express beauty as an experienced reality. 
So it brings people together to build, to create, to make more beauty in their existence. So wouldn't it be wonderful, guys, to know, to really know in every cell in your body that when you left this plane, when we die, that we have made love in and with the world. We have made more beauty in everything we did. Now, what better legacy than, than that? And it doesn't have to express as a physical building. It can be in a loving comment or a touch to somebody you don't know in a moment of need. That could be enough to change the world. So when we apply that possibility in this creation of space, something magical happens. So this is, as many of you would know, uh, the ceiling, the space of the great cathedral that Gaudi manifested that's still actually being built in Barcelona. So only life, consciousness, consciousness and focused attention has the power to bring a space alive and generate an experience within that space. If that attention is removed and the space becomes vacant once more, it reverts to its original neutral state. So a place like this is well known. People travel all over the world to see it. There is a constant flow of people and conscious attention entering and exiting this building and being elevated in the process. The building doesn't elevate them, but the building gives them an opportunity to expand and be reflected their own inner sense of beauty, their own capacity to feel and express beauty and truth in themselves. So sacred space, which is a beautiful, simple expression, most massively misunderstood, that sacred space is imprinted with the source coding, and it, but it remains neutral until consciousness directly engages with it. So then the space can shine. It radiates with the love that is invoked and evoked through the sensory experience of beauty. This is actually a photograph of looking up directly in the ceiling of a temple in Santiago in Chile, South America. And it was a Baha'i temple and a very, very beautiful space. I look forward to seeing it someday. Okay, here we go. Beauty has been and continues to be assailed by two primary cults of belief, of design belief. One of them is the cult of ugliness and the other is the cult of utility. And they're, they're very closely related, of course. But what's really interesting is that the image on the bottom left, it looks like visual vomit. And, uh, but you'll see that the crucifix on the top left of the image, on the balance point on the other wall at the high level, there is a half a circle, a semicircle, or a half a sphere. Contained within it is half of a dodecahedron. So a dodecahedron, for those that have eyes to see and, and ears to hear, is one of the five platonic solids and considered by many people the fundamental fractal dynamic of life and love itself. So in such an abortion of a building, um, you can see that they've, for some crazy reason, they have thrown in a dodecahedron, perhaps in the attempts that this will make the place sacred. So, oh, we have sacred geometry. We're very aware of what we're doing. But this is a classic example of a space that lacks coherence, lacks any understanding of beauty, beauty that extends far beyond an, a, an aesthetic opinion. So utility and ugliness are vandalizing our built environment. And there is a detriment to this because we lose meaning because 90, 95, 98% of us are living in buildings that are intrinsically ugly. So there's a couple of slides here that might delight. Here we have the, uh, a slight change on the classic architectural expression, form follows function, which has really informed, literally and metaphorically, so much of the modern architecture that's causing so much sensory stress in the world. But in this case, form is following dysfunction. So just have a look at what's going on here, guys. You know, there is the, it displays a lack of consciousness about space. Particularly, look at the bottom right image, which is a, a, a built stairways based on the drawings. So, as of course, you can imagine rising up the stairs and what will happen quite soon halfway up. So, it seems to be that 
no matter how beautiful the notion of the original design, that level of beauty must be felt and appreciated by the people who physically build it as well. So the beauty must be penetrating all aspects of the creation of space, not just the original design intent, but the, the investor, the facilitator, the builder, the planners, the inhabitants, all must, be, almost, all must open to the effects of beauty if it's going to be coherently real as a final space. Another image here. What happens when you see these things? When you look at this, now, you know, being Irish, I'm intrinsically rebellious, and, uh, and Zana being Slovakian would have the same genetic predisposition. So we like to play, we like to um, challenge and be a little bit provocative. But in these two cases, I don't think it's, it's, it's what was happening. On the, the image on the left was probably just saying, somebody just saying, feck it, you know, just, it's, it's, it's half an hour over when I should be home, or there's a football match on, I'll just finish this. Or perhaps the person who did it, did it just to get a reaction. Doesn't matter, but when we see it, what does it evoke on us? If there's a part of you that is playful, you might just think, ha but also it could disturb. And on the right, look, at, look what's there. So there's an old and new pathway, and whoever put it together really didn't care. So that level of not caring is a direct symbol and metaphor for disconnection. So here we have two images. And uh, the one on the left was recently posted on Facebook. And uh, it immediately caught my eye, if you pardon the pun, because I love geometry. I'm a little bit obsessed. And when I saw that, it was indicating that when you have a vesica Pisces and when you dance a little bit with the geometry, you'll see that the green and the red line on the left-hand image, we are told that they are in phi or golden proportion. Phi, phi, golden proportion, phi, phi, fo, fum. So anyone that sees that is thinking, wow, that's so cool. And I noted that within minutes, this post had about 10,000 likes and was shared a thousand times. So what you have is a massive escalation of belief in something that may not be true. So in order to satisfy myself, I, had, I recreated the same image and explored it. And on the bottom right, you will see that the red and the green was as per the original drawing, but the red and the yellow is actually golden proportion. So it wasn't even close. It was a massive disproportionality and basically lack of truth. So I mentioned this not with any judgment over the posting, the posting of the poster. That has nothing to do with it. The point I'm seeking to make here, the point that we wish to illustrate, is that we absolutely wish for everyone watching and listening to this not to believe a word we say, but to let the words point to something moving inside of you and let that at best be motivation and impulse for you to be inspired enough to find what's true for you. And that's a good step towards knowing what's true. So don't believe anything we say or show, but uh, hopefully you can feel that it's true for us and we're seeking for it to be, for that truth in us to be as close as possible to the truth. So a little story. When Zana and I first met, I was absolutely obsessed with trying to impress her with my great knowledge. And so uh, one day we were going for a walk in, 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 in nature. And, uh, oh, Mr. Clever Sacred Geometer, I wanted to show her on a sunflower, a big sunflower, to show her that uh, the number of seeds or, or spirals in clockwise direction was always in Fibonacci to the numbers in the anti-clockwise level direction. We see this in every Photoshop uh, graphic whenever somebody is speaking about sacred geometry. And so I said, hey, look, come here, look at this. And I counted the number. And I was a little bit nervous because it wasn't one of the Fibonacci numbers, which is basically a numeric system or sequence in, in nature that uh, many things align with. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, so on. And any number divided by the predecessor gives you closer and closer to the golden ratio, 1.618. Sacred geometry, blah, blah, blah. 
But the point here is that I was absolutely sure and convinced to the point of deep conviction that I would be able to show her some truth. So um, it wasn't Fibonacci. It wasn't even close. So immediately I said, okay, this sunflower is broken or it's somehow mutated. So I immediately jumped to another one and uh, see, you know, this one is going to be better. It too was not Fibonacci. So of course, all I could assume then was that there was some um, negative geopathic stress or some sort of electromagnetic pollution that was mutating these poor sunflowers. But the reality is we were in a pristine natural environment in the middle of Austria, you know, that had uh, no evidence of any disturbance. So that to me was a kick in my complacency. It was a, um, a punch right into my intellectual ego. And it was the first point of departure that gave me the gift of realizing that I didn't know anything really for, for truth. So this is when we just want to introduce the concept of modeling. I'm conscious of time, Roger, so I'll, I'll jump ahead. So modeling, be it feng shui, sacred geometry, bioarchitecture, they can reveal many understandings and, and uh, movements within us and help us massively to understand the world. But regardless of the elegance or capacity to explain, they can never really represent truth or express beauty. Now, in the last few years, there is a new design protocol. I will not call it a philosophy. It's a protocol, which is called parametric design. Have you heard of it, Roger? No, but uh, yeah, but... I've only heard of it briefly. I don't know too much. I have, yeah, I don't know too much about it. Well, that's okay, but uh, I didn't either, I must say. So it's, it's, a, it's an expression used to describe when you can pump in information or parameters into a computer program and you press enter. And what you get is a shape or form that is a product of whatever parameters you input it. So you can basically go into 3D software, um, set an initial set of conditions and some sort of factors or parameters of expansion and press return. And then you, you get these shapes. So what results is very dramatic, dynamic, interesting, and impressive shapes. And it doesn't take much then to insert a few people, introduce a ground floor level perception view, and call them buildings. So we are basically doing the same thing we've always done. We obsessionally dive into a new technology, whether it was a crystal technology back in the time of Atlantis, or whether it was a mass production of building materials and understandings at the turn of the last century. But now we're doing the same thing again. We're rushing headlong into expressing a new spatial dynamic without knowing what the hell's going on. So we're like kindergarten again, being playing with building blocks, creating space. So guys, it's important that whoever hears me, we're not judging this. We are not saying it's bad. This is an exciting new development for humanity to have these tools to weave and shape and form space. So we're not Luddites and anti-technology, far from it. But we wish to make the point is that we're, we're jumping ahead to create uh, spatial constructions without understanding the intrinsic nature of form and beauty in terms of uh, consciousness and in terms of our ability to interact coherently with it. So this is a slide showing some images of real buildings. Actually, the one on the left is a real building. And the other, and bottom right also is a shop, but the upper right one is just a graphic, a computer graphic that could easily be a city. So initially, the, these images are designed to wow us. It's like an addictive hit, in the same way that um, a smoker gets a hit from a, a puff of nicotine, or most uh, young people get a hit of serotonin and dopamine in their brain when they get a new like on Facebook. So this addictive tendency is being uh, amplified with these images. And there's a whole new wave of discrepancy between architectural renderings that are given to a client to impress them and evoke investment and the final, the final building, which is a bitter disappointment. 
because the initial wow factor that hits us at that sensory perceptional level is not followed through in the reality at all and doesn't continue to excite past the first point of excitement. So what does connect us to a space? That's the big question. So what is living space? So it is our contention and our assertion that any human constructed space or object, no matter how natural the materials we use or the techniques of construction, it is a neutral potential of energy and information which is only activated through the consciousness of the observer interface experiencer. So like what in this is more living and alive? So we, we, we tipped the hat at the designer on the right who sought to introduce a natural algorithm made out of fiberglass or plastic to create an effect. You know, but what is living space when we see that? So we, we wish to uh, communicate this basic message that to us the object itself has no power to change, no emission of healing energy, no innate consciousness, no higher or greater importance or value in terms of truth. It is only there to invite the opportunity for focus and to open another creative spark from source. So we see online many people saying that their architecture can heal. And that is a dangerous assertion because it's missing the whole point in our opinion. So for example, bioarchitecture, the, the, the science of building spaces that can heal you. Is that true? That's the big question. Healing may happen, but the buildings don't do it. So if the, this is the key, if the object is beautiful, if it's well made, if it's consciously shaped and fully utilized, fully loved and nurtured and maintained, it will continue to reverberate with the original source coding, the original setting and the original intention. This is where a building can absolutely have a radiant sense of being alive because it's been nurtured by the inhabitants. And it is through the pursuit of beauty we shape the world as a home. And through it we wish to understand our, our own nature as spiritual beings. So to us, what is called sacred and beautiful, they are two doors, two side-by-side -side doors that open to a single space. And that space is where we find home. So we can shape space into home, but the, only through the interaction of our consciousness. This is a cartoon we did a few years ago, and on the right is actually a building that's been built as we speak in Chile. So it's a new house, and because of the inclement weather at this time of year, the client actually bought and erected a massive tent over the house so that the builders could work all night and day with floodlights and not stop but they're really enjoying it. And what the image on the left is actually pretty much what they're doing on the right. So that's a, a playful example of what's possible. So some of you would have seen these images before, but you know, we continue to be inspired by nature and our work is seeking to offer and invite beauty. Beauty not as a formulaic model, but beauty as a a direct response to the land, the sighting, the people, the space, where it wishes to be, that that can only exist as a singular expression of truth. And that truth is a pathway to beauty. And as holistic designers and people who are more and more understanding the nature of repleted space, we are offering that possibility to you, to anyone listening, anyone that has a project, of course, that's what's on offer here. And in order for us to be able to do this, we are um, continuously tuning our own movements with the compass of life itself, which is the ever-present, unstoppable, unchangeable conscious commitment to discover, choose, and express truth as the only path to love, as the only journey that makes sense in terms of beauty. So this is where, only a couple of slides left, this is where we get an opportunity to just introduce this thing that came alive when we met that was the spark that brought us together and that continues to feed and fuel our our ability and capacity to create a repleted life together and a repleted space for those that come to us so temples of life are vibrant 
constructions conceived, designed, built and enjoyed for the sole purpose of experiencing, generating and celebrating all aspects of beauty and love. So they will exist in physical form all over the world. And we're actually in the process of procuring the first one in the heart of Slovakia. And so in order to, to know and to open to where these uh, can and may be, what came to us also was this notion of divine mapping. So on the previous slide, we can see that proportions in the human body are a map to the temple of the body and the temple of life. They're a harmonic cascade of proportional uh, relationships that can be used as a map. So in this case, we anchored this particular geometry, one end on the place we will be building in the middle of Slovakia, and we invite people to connect with us and be part of that creation, absolutely. And the other end is the building you've been in, Roger, it's, uh, uh, is Genesis, the, the building, my building in Ireland. So they were, they were two anchor points within which this geometry was invited. And what's amazing is that in this beautiful, complex pattern of harmony, there are a number of key points that are already presenting themselves as, uh, uh, as points for these temples, for these spaces, for these um, constructions. And what's beautiful is that pre-existing clients before this understanding or this mapping are on many of these lines. So that's so exciting to us. That, that's like, holy moly, look what's going on. So we're well aware, well aware that you can take any map and throw any pattern on top of it and you can derive meaning. So we're not claiming this as an ultimate uh, truth. We're merely saying that this impulse in us to explore what came to us as divine mapping is dancing with future memory. It is a process of feeling, identifying, connecting, and graphically articulating points and movements of future memories into an interpenetrating network of truth, wisdom, and love. Lovely definition. And we're dancing with it and we're open to it. And of course, whether the world is flat or spherical or oblong or toroidal, doesn't matter. The map is creating the reality in much the same way that it's simulated you know, the theory of simulated reality is that we are rendering the simulated truth, this reality, through our consciousness. And many thinkers, philosophers, scientists are beginning to explore, are we in a simulation? In which case, what, who is the user? Who is the programmer? Who is the experiencer? Who's the player? And what are the objects and things that the player and user uses? And what are the role of consciousness in this? So we'll finish with this slide. And a beautiful quote from William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So we've been talking for an hour and it's probably felt like an eternity to some of you. So uh, we'll finish with this. Our website is zen.design. Isn't it so cool? It's not zendesign.com. It's just zen.design. A little bit about us and an email at the bottom, zemarc at zen.design. So that's it. That's the uh, download, the sharing, the explosion of possibility. The key point to synthesize and express is that beauty is not a secondary uh, component of design. Beauty is a force of nature. Beauty is the language of source. Beauty is a power that has the capacity to change everything, guys. It not only fuels and moves our individual uh, ability and capacity to create, but it will absolutely change the nature of reality and human expression into the future. So we need to make beauty the core of our interpersonal relationships, the core of our connection and feeling to physical space around us, and the core of our love for our own bodies and for who we are in the world. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much. And we're very open to answer some questions now. Well, right. Thanks, Michael. It's a beautiful, comprehensive, amazing presentation. Very poetical per usual. Thank you. Hey, guys, if you guys, 
put your put your questions into the Q and A down the bottom, not the chat window. Just put it down in the Q and A. And we've got a couple of questions from Sean. Hello, Mr. Rice. In your work, what have you found that each stakeholder contains and meets energetically, spiritually? And that's a question mark. So what? Okay. Yeah. Can you synopsize the question, Roger? I didn't fully hear it. Can you synopsize it? Yeah, basically he's asking what sort of energetic qualities can be found in shapes. For instance, triangle, square, hexagon, pentagon, octagon, etc. I mean, in sacred geometry, as we know, we go through each of these shapes and there's those basic 10 shapes that, sure. you know, in sacred geometry 101, you get to know how to draw them, and Michael, of course, has been applying them into his designs for quite a few decades. Probably the leading architect in the world about how to actually physicalize these amazing forms and shapes. And each one has a particular quality to it. So maybe, Michael, just, um, we don't have to go through all of these shapes, but it wouldn't be a problem to us between a square, and a pentagon and an octagon and and what are your favorite shapes <laughs> my favorite shapes yeah. um my partner <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so it's a huge question and it's it's the source of a weekend seminar but i do recall many times together roger when we were teaching sacred geometry as a physical art using a compass on a piece of paper with straight edge we would get people and show people how to draw the vesica Pisces, the square, the triangle, etc. And we would invite them to feel into it. In other words, feel, it, feel what they just created. And people would generally describe a range of, um, not necessarily emotions, but senses that the shape seemed to evoke in them. Of course, the triangle left to itself doesn't care what it is or what it's, emanating. This is not emanating anything, but consciousness that's able to interact with that shape uh, gives it meaning and also evokes a sense of symmetric response. So in other words, the shape, the geometry reflects consciousness and gives us a chance to experience something. So for example, a triangle, if it was a physical room in a building, that angle that 60 degree angle is not very comfortable to live within or to be within. It has a quality that we fight, feel a little bit restrictive. The space is not emanating restriction. The space is just what it is, a neutral construction. But when we go in there and when our consciousness wishes to expand and not necessarily be squished, then we have an experience that we generate, which gives us a chance to know ourselves a little bit more. So for sure, you can go through the square as a sense of the grounding and stability, the pentagon, which evokes a feeling of expansion and connectivity and sharing, the hexagon, which is epitomizing efficiency of form and minimal use of material, etc. So we can derive and establish meaning and shared understanding about these shapes. So there are qualities that these shapes evoke in us and sensations that are alive within our perception when we physically engage with them, create them, draw them. But they, they themselves don't have any effect. Consciousness is both the originator, the creator, and the activator of the feeling. It's, it's not there without that. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's the yeah, best. Hello, Michael. That's fun. And Sean was also asking about the energetic spiritual differences between 2D and 3D. And um, also the position of either shape uh, into the cardinal direction. Uh, the effects on the Earth's energy lines on shape and the shape on the energy lines. So there's about five questions here. Let's break it down a little bit. All right. So let's just talk a little bit about the difference between 2D and 3D shapes for you. Okay. So... 2D and 3D are basically maps. They are maps of focus. 
So we can have a single point that has no dimensionality whatsoever, and that ultimately evokes intense focus. Then we can have two, a two-dimensional expression of that, which would be a line or a series of lines, like a drawing or a map. And we engage with that, and our brain and our ability to perceive it is automatically doing a number of things. It's trying to establish orientation, it's trying to generate meaning, and it's trying to navigate and ultimately develop or generate a uh, we seem to have lost you a little bit there, Michael. Your um, your your screen has uh, frozen a bit, Mike. And so what number? Uh, Michael? Yes, yes. Uh, your, your screen froze a little bit there and we didn't hear you. So just repeat the last, you know. Um. Okay. For some reason, your, your internet has sort of dropped out a little bit. It's been... Um, can you hear me here, Roger? I can hear you, yes. So, Mike, um, can you hear me? <clears throat> well, folks, <laughs> it looks like we've actually lost Michael uh, due to some sort of uh, internet bug here, the usual. <clears throat> Uh, Michael, are you able to uh, hear me? We might be able to get him back if he comes back into the webinar, if he signs back in. The other thing we might be able to do, guys, there's some good questions here. And I'll, I'll be able to, uh, I think I'm able to copy them off the chat box here. I'll, make, I'll start making a copy of them while we're waiting for, for Michael. And I should be able to put it in an email to Michael. Uh, there's a question here from Tufan, I've got that, from William. <clears throat> and when I send out the recording, we'll be able to uh, get Michael to answer some of these questions. So I'm just sort of coming in now and copying them into a file here. So. Yeah, guys, it looks like, it looks like we've, uh, unfortunately, lost Michael. I can't see him coming back in. Oh, no. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's good. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. So Oops. we're back. Oh. Well, you still don't leave the meeting. You've pushed, um, yeah, don't push that one. You there, Mike? Okay. Okay, well, look, Mike, I'm here. we can get into some other questions. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, perfectly. we can hear you. So, Sean's asked a couple of questions, but I think, uh, well, just one more from Sean. Uh, and, and it's a good question. Basically, the cardinal directions, the effects of the Earth's energy lines on shape, and then that shape back onto the Earth's energy lines. That's a good question. So what, what are your uh, comments on that? It's a fantastic question. Okay. And um, thank you, Sean. Great questions. And of course, your question is a question that I've asked for, for decades, and we are asking in a fresh way now. 
So if I understand the question, the, the Earth's, Earth's geomagnetic or energetic lines, what effect does that have in space and what effect does the space have on that? And uh, so our understanding is that in nature, in the literal meaning of the word nature, in something that is directly fractally connected with source, what we have is a a natural pattern of information and energy that's following its own chi lines, its own pathways, its own pure expression of truth. We come along then and we create a shape or a form and we place it on or in or under or above the landscape. And we perceive a difference in effect. We can measure this with dowsing and with physiology. And in some cases, we can even measure it with uh, uh, some technology. However, just like the double slit experiment, the actual, we're not measuring the effect, we're measuring the conscious assumption that is epitomized in the measurement process. We're measuring the effect of consciousness in the interplay of the energetics of the land, not the, not the interplay of the shape itself. Because the moment we approach to measure, we, it's the consciousness that's having the effect, not the space. It's a classic case of, you know, that cliche that if a, if a tree falls in the forest, does it still make a noise if there's no one there to hear it? You know, and that has been debated by so many people over the years. There might be an impact when it hits the ground and that can create a vibrational effect, but it doesn't become sound unless it's heard by an ear and, and turned into that sensory experience of reality. So... Yes, there is that buildings can have the apparent effect of adjusting the earth energy, but really it's an expression of consciousness changing as a result of the interface with that space. So that might seem counterintuitive or might seem like a cop-out, but that's our direct experience and our fresh understanding, which I should say continues to expand and grow. So it's an expression of our current understanding, but we're very open to continue to develop it into higher levels of understanding and practical application. Right. So there is absolutely well, the effect. We've got a space. few questions here, Mike, so we'll okay. just keep moving, yeah? Uh, Mart Martin asks, is a healing process in a bio building measurable? So, the beginning of that question again, Roger, just say it. Is it yeah, possible to... Basic, he's basically asking, can we measure the healing effects of a, a, a bio, you know, building? Is it uh, measurable? And this, of course, is some of the work that Dan Winter has done. Oh, absolutely. Can we measure the uh, benefits of it? Sorry, Mike, you... I, I, I was, they didn't hear what you say, so you carry on. Okay, thank you. It, it's, it's interfacing nicely with the previous question and the answer that how is it possible to measure the healing effects of a space without us playing a role in that? It's not possible. We can't do it. Even if we set some instrument in the building and go away and come back the next morning and measure something, we're still interfacing it in terms of expectation, assumption, presupposition, belief, and the interface between the technology and our own understanding of what's going on. So for sure, people can enter into a space, be it natural or man-made, and have an experience of apparent change. But the best thing a space can do for us, a constructed space, is reflect um, our own inner truth, which through beauty primarily, but our own inner truth, which allows us to reconnect with source. Because healing is not necessary with source, because there's, sickness is not possible with source. Source is the pure principle health of living energy. So we, a space can give us an opportunity to tune and focus our own attention and our own capacity to feel and experience and generate health through conscious connection to source. So that's the best a building can do. But a building cannot 
generate some uh, invisible healing energy that uh, directly touches us or directly heals us. That would be, in our opinion, a limited perspective and a dangerous path to make assumption on. But the real life effects are, are those of healing for sure. The effects, the apparent effects can be described as a healing experience for sure. Great. Okay, William has uh, an interesting question. Do you have any thoughts about protecting space from the invasive EMFs, such as the G5 now rolling out in the USA? Oh yeah, the 5G, that's, that's toxic to life. I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed, only a few weeks ago there was an experiment done in the Netherlands, in Holland, for those Americans, please forgive me, that's a country in Europe. <laughs> but uh, a, a reason, uh, they switched it on in an urban environment, a 5G test. And within minutes, uh, up to, I think it was 290 birds had literally dropped dead out of the sky in a nearby park. Really? Yeah. Oh, I mean, type it in, just 5G test in the Netherlands, and you'll, you'll learn more about this. Again, like that image of the Vesica Pisces, I don't know if it's true. I just saw a post about this, so it's worth exploring. So in order for us to protect ourselves, if that's the essence of the question, from harmful EMF fields, I, I, we absolutely understand the impulse beside, behind the question. We, we, like everyone else, have experienced directly the effects of electromagnetic pollution in the environment. And it's a difficult answer. It's a difficult situation and a difficult answer. Because if we were going to be highly bullshit spiritual, we would say, hey man, it's all just energy. You know, L live with it and let it go through you in a spiritual way. But that's not very useful. The key is that the best thing you can possibly do is to build your own immune membrane, your own immune system. And that can be done through beauty because if we start opening to beauty we're we're developing a true understanding of ourselves our own system our own physiology that which is in balance and out of balance and if we start to evoke and the key here is truth that if we accept what is true first of all is it true that the 5g is killing us there's lots of evidence that it might but we need to find out is it true then we need to say if it is true then is it true for me if it is true for me, then what's the truth of the impact? If the truth of the impact is directly affecting my physiology, then how can I embrace a, a physiological, psychological state that minimizes and possibly eliminates, eliminates the effect? How can I create an environment that's so beautiful and so in truth that a discordant field is not welcome and just doesn't have a chance to get in the front door? That's a very different response than protecting yourself from it. So you can just make it not possible for it to be affecting you in the first place. That's very different than seeking to defend or, or protect yourself. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's a great answer, Michael. Uh, we have a question from Tufan. Uh, hi, Michael. Thanks hi. for the great presentation. I remember yeah. a project of yours named The Mole Hill built in Canada. I could not see it on your website now, but wanted to ask if you are still building such projects with glass roofs. Any feedback from that project? We loved it. Well, because, uh, not directly actually, because I've been involved in so many designs over the years, and quite often it was only for the design stage at which point I would give that design to the client. And then the client had complete freedom to, to build it and create it themselves. In many cases, of course, we, we retained communication pathways and got to experience and, and see the results. But in some cases, no. So I remember that design you're talking about, but I actually I could not tell you if it was built. And uh, that probably sounds a bit weird to people, that something that it would seem that a huge amount of investment of creative energy went into producing. It seems as if I don't care if it was built or not. That's not really what I'm suggesting here. It's that uh, the 
freedom to create is also the freedom to give it away. I don't mean financially give it away. I mean, give it away without putting any limits or conditions on it. Because a beauty, uh, in a way, must be shared without expectation. In fact, it's the only way that beauty can be uh, successfully transmitted into a truthful expression. To be given without any uh, uh, requirement that there is a feedback loop. If a feedback loop generates naturally, that's wonderful. In the case of the woman, the client and the friend in Australia who just connected in, not knowing that we were talking today and, uh, and connected in and sent that photograph of the lotus flower. You know, so connections can last, absolutely. So specifically, I don't know if that building was built. And, uh, but there's not room in the, on the website to have all the buildings in there. We always seek to just put enough there to stimulate interest and uh, excitement. Well, Michael, that's pretty much the, the questions. So, and we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time now. So look, um, folks, you've got Michael's website. I strongly rec recommend that you really invest in the website. And uh, you've, um, you've got his email. So if anybody's interested, I'll be putting the recording up on the YouTube within a, in a few days. So look, um, thank you everybody from all over the world. You know, I've had people from really all over the world. Uh, about 120 uh, registrations. And uh, I, I'd like to thank you all for uh, attending. And also Michael, wonderful work you're doing. It's just great uh, having you in my life, mate. And it's about time to oh. hop over to New York someday, yeah? Oh, absolutely, we'd absolutely love to, yes. And um, we just like finally say, like, Roger, I have to say, and this isn't massaging your ego, but if you recall 20 years ago when we met in Massachusetts, I was full of confusion about feng shui and life and the Tao and architecture, design, everything. And I have to say, in the first seven minutes of hearing you speak, everything began to make sense. So never forget that. That was a key moment of clarity for me. And uh, I know you've gone from strength to strength to express it even more sublimely and effectively. So good on you, mate. Thank you. Oh, and thanks. I'm very happy in my life thanks, too. Michael, you made my day, mate. <laughs> so the basic message to all who listen and hear this is that we are for sure open to support, help, guide, and, and inspire you to create beauty in your life. From a small adjustment to your apartment to a city of light, why the hell not? Like literally just uh, anything's possible, we're open, we seek to create beauty and to express it in all we do. And that's it guys, we'd love to create beauty with you. So Roger, thank you, everyone listening, watching, hearing, thank you too, and uh, we'll be in touch. Great, I'll speak to you soon, Michael, and bye everybody. Love Ciao. from us, thank you, bye-bye.